Good afternoon, everyone. Hello and welcome to the Yale School of Management MBA for Executives panel to highlight the Posen Commonwealth Fund Fellowship in Health Equity Leadership. My name is Winnie Sung and I have the privilege to serve as the Assistant Dean for the MBA for Executives program. I'm joined today by Dr. Howie Foreman, Faculty Director of the Healthcare Area Focus, Dr. Marcella Smith, Faculty Director for the Fellowship, and Dr. Stephen Starks, alumnus from the class of 2023 and opposing Commonwealth Fund Fellow. Thank you all for joining us today to hear about this wonderful fellowship at the Yale School of Management and the significant roles our panelists, fellows, and the program plays in solving for inequality within healthcare and dismantling structural barriers that exist within the healthcare system. Through them, I hope you will learn more about the mission of the Posen Commonwealth Fellowship and its significance within the MBA for Executives program. We'll spend the next 45 minutes or so with our panelists and save a few minutes at the end of uh, our session to answer your questions live. Um, the Posen Commonwealth Fund Fellowship is sponsored by the Commonwealth Fund and the Yale School of Management MBA for Executives program and is also endowed by a generous gift from Robert C. Posen, a member of the Yale Law School class of 1972. For those of you who may not be familiar with the Commonwealth Fund, it was established in 1918 by Anna M. Harkness with a mandate to do something good for the welfare of mankind. The Commonwealth Fund promotes a high performing healthcare system that achieves better access, improved quality, and greater efficiency, particularly for society's most vulnerable, including low income people, the uninsured, and people of color. I want to take a moment before we get started to thank our panelists of esteemed healthcare providers for being with us today. They're incredibly busy and in demand, uh, but I know you're so committed to taking the time to educate us on this important opportunity to make a difference in healthcare through leadership. And now let's get started with the best part of today. So it is my pleasure to, um, to introduce our panel panelists and really allow them to introduce themselves. So if we can start with Dr. Marcella Nunes-Smith. Well, thank you so much, Wendy. You know, I, I look forward to having this conversation every time we do this, because um, I get excited anew about this great opportunity. Um, thanks everybody for joining and for your interest uh, in learning more about the Posen Commonwealth Fund Fellowship. I'm Marcella Nunes-Smith, uh, Associate Dean for Health Equity Research um, uh, at Yale. I'm just really honored deeply to serve as the director for this unique program. I'm looking forward to sharing more about, um, about this opportunity with you in our time today. And Dr. Foreman, if you would go next. Sure, I'm uh, Howie Foreman. I am the co-founder of the Executive MBA program at Yale, which we launched in 2003. Um, and I, with Dr. Nunez-Smith, am fortunate enough to have been part of the uh, inception of this program, the Posen Commonwealth Fund Fellowship. Um, and I continue to play a special advisory role to the fellowship. I'm a practicing diagnostic radiologist, uh, and I teach health policy in both undergraduate and graduate programs at Yale right now. Thank you. And Dr. Starts. Uh, yeah, I'm an alumnus of the fellowship program in the class of 2023. Uh, I'm a, a geriatric psychiatrist and medical educator based in Houston, Texas. I'm clinical assistant professor at the Tillman J. Fertitta Family College of Medicine at the University of Houston. Uh, and I, I practice here, um, am a part of our curricular uh, design uh, committee uh, and serve as clerkship director uh, in our college. Uh, look forward to today's conversation. Thank you so much. So maybe if I can start with Dr. Foreman, um, you mentioned you're the founder, uh, the co-founder of the MBA for Executives program at, here at Yale. Um, can you share with us some historical context for what was the inspiration to launch the EMBA program and uh, and how, uh, focus on healthcare especially, and then how did the Posen Commonwealth Fund Fellowship come to the Yale School of Management? Right, so first of all, thanks for, for hosting this and, and it's really great to see such uh, an amazing attendance. And I know many of you will also watch this um, 
uh, asynchronously, and we're going to continue to be here to answer your questions even after the recording's over today. Um, Yale School of Management was founded just four and a half decades ago, I think, maybe five decades ago now, with a mission to serve not just business and society, but to help develop leaders in both the public and private sector spaces, not just as we think for most business schools about the private sector, but the public sector as well, including the non-for-profit sector and the government sector. And it has continued to be well known for that, even after it transitioned the degree that it offered in the mid 1990s from an MPPM, a master's of public and private management into a more traditional master's of business administration. It continued to attract and develop talent in the space to serve society as well as business, as well as other sectors. So it was very natural that the School of Management would begin to develop coursework and develop um, educational opportunities in the healthcare space starting in the 1990s and continuing on into the early 2000s. And around that time when we had our first class of MD MBA students, and we already had some MPH MBA students, it became time for the school to contemplate that their first executive MBA offering might be in the healthcare space. And so when we launched the program, which was started by myself and Stan Garskar, retired deputy dean, and Dick Whitting, a, a much beloved professor of marketing, it was started in 2003 and 2005, we seeded our first class. And in 2007, we graduated our first class. It was exclusively healthcare. And once we got that right, very much with the help of, of Wendy and her team, once we got you know one track right, we added additional tracks. But our mission never changed in terms of what we wanted to be able to do to develop leaders in the healthcare sector. About six, about seven years ago, I guess, um, we were we faced the opportunity presented to us by the Commonwealth Fund to compete with about 60 other institutions in the country uh, for a health equity leadership fellowship. And they offered us a lot of latitude in how to structure such a program. And ultimately, working with uh, Dr. Nunez Smith, working with Dean Bach, who was de then the deputy dean of the School of Management, and with enormous support, not just from the Commonwealth Fund, but from the School of Management, we were able to launch the very special health equity fellowship that we're talking about today. Our vision for that is, is consistent with our previous vision as well, that we believe that with management education and with the added features of the fellowship, that we will be able to help catalyze the careers of people who are already committed to health equity, who are already committed to a more just society, to breaking down the structural barriers to delivering better care, breaking dip down, breaking down the structural barriers to even be able to access care um, and to hopefully have a more just health care um, available to everybody and, and have more just health outcomes for everybody. And so we find ourselves in this position now where we've now had several graduating classes, and I think the results speak for themselves, and it'll be a great opportunity here from Dr. Starks. Um, about um, what his journey has been like. And I know Dr. Nunya Smith will also reflect on, on what her passions are because she has come to this area for a lot longer than I have. So thanks for letting me speak. Thank you. And I, I do also wanna say that having this fellow, these fellows in the program really adds a level of uh, depth and uh, Ex, um, you know, ability for our students in general to be able to expand how they think and uh, think about these issues more. So thank you for that. Um, Dr. Nina Smith, uh, I'd love to find out as the faculty director for uh, this fellowship, um, how is the fellowship designed to support leaders in health equity? And what is your vision for, you know, the anticipated impact you want to see these fellows have within health equity? Yeah. So, um, you know, it's a great, um, uh, it really is a great question, right? Especially the success piece. And I, 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 um, I love listening to Dr. Foreman talk about the origin stories of this fellowship, right? Because 
um, I remember exactly wh where we were when uh, how we whispered and said, hey, do we want to try to to do this? Right. And it was a resounding yes to try. And the thoughtfulness, the intention from that very first conversation has carried, you know, right on through and thinking about how to design something that is unique, that does take advantage and leverage this outstanding uh EMBA program here at the School of Management um, and really layer on this opportunity for those people who have already demonstrated their deep commitment, their expertise uh, in health equity. And so that really was the beginning of the conversation, right? Thinking about all these assets that are here um, and recognizing the unique opportunity. You know, as as how we said, it's it's been a couple of decades for me um, thinking about health equity questions. And this, I think, is is part of maybe what we've been missing, is making sure people have the set of skills that you can earn here at Yale and through the MBA, um, and to bring that into the toolbox. So we that's the starting point. Um, and then as we go through our conversation, we'll talk much more about the other co-curricular opportunities, I think, that the fellowship brings. But I do want to start off by saying that we recognize just how essential and unique um, not just the MBA, but the MBA here at Yale, right? And why that is the perfect starting point for people who want to go deeper and run their um, their knowledge, their expertise, their abilities to really make change, right? And that's what success looks like. Um, because of this program and like how we am very thankful to the Commonwealth Fund, to Bob Posen, to the School uh, of Management, um, very grateful to my colleagues at the Equity Research and Innovation Center, the other leaders of the program, Drs. Uh, Gonzalez Colasso and Dr. Calhoun, right, all thinking together about how to see each and every fellow, um, their individual goals and tailor it, right? So success is not a blanket answer, right? But it's about helping people get to a place with their skills, with the knowledge network, right? Having access to um, a, a whole community of sponsors and mentors, guides and others who will create, recognize the talent and create opportunity to uh, take advantage of that. The success is gonna be different, but it's gonna be about people bringing transformative change to the sector um, where they are. Uh, and that is how we think about it. So I'm really excited to go deeper on the particular elements, but it begins with this incredible uh, MBA through the EMBA healthcare track, uh, and then the layering on of a fellowship that really recognize each person's goals um, with some community-wide activities, but also a lot of individualized tailoring mentoring. That's wonderful. And, and I know that Dr. Starks can probably provide a lot more uh, color in terms of his own experience. Um, and I'd love to have you uh, talk a little bit about uh, sort of what drew you to uh, the uh, the Yale Executive Program and and the fellowship. Uh, what kind of inspired you to apply to here? Yeah, great. Thank you so much. Um, and I think it's it's part of what kind of um, Marcella was alluding to before is I was at the point in my career transitioning from early career to mid career uh, and thinking about like what's next. Uh, I felt like in psychiatric practice, there were so many challenges and uh, ensuring that patients have affordable access to high quality care uh, and thinking a little bit about my role and what I was able to do uh, uh, to, to, again, kind of create uh, uh, and provide the type of, of psychiatric care that, that patients uh, need uh, and deserve. Uh, at the time um, that I started to kind of formulate uh, about what my next step was and started to think about uh, management studies. I was uh, working in DC on, on Capitol Hill. I was doing a congressional fellowship at the time and felt like I had a great grounding uh, in terms of understanding the uh, challenges in psychiatric care based on my practice as a physician, starting my career uh, working um, in the Department of Veterans Affairs uh, here in Houston. I uh, was in DC on Capitol Hill, so uh, able to learn and explore more about my interest in policies that really drive the meaningful changes that uh, individuals need and communities need uh, to access uh, mental health care, uh, but felt like I had some gaps. So in my engagement with constituents, in my engagement with interest groups, in my engagement with lawmakers, just really saw that I had a gap in understanding the challenges as it particularly pertained to the business of healthcare uh, and healthcare economics. And so it was really looking for an opportunity to grow. Uh, and that's when I, I started my search uh, to figure out where are the places that could help me grow. 
Uh, and in my search, and based on the fact that I had done uh, some of my training um, uh, in uh, at Yale, uh, I was aware of SOM. <laughs> that actually, I had not had the opportunity to engage with Howie back in, in 2014. Uh, it was finishing off my fellowship, uh, my clinical fellowship in geriatric psychiatry at uh, Yale New Haven uh, Health Center. And um, I had gone to a, a session, one of my, my program director uh, had I reached out to Howie to offer uh, the fellows at the time a session uh, on the Affordable Care Act. Uh, and I remember it was in Evans Hall and I was very inspired to go because I felt like if uh, I could uh, really truly engage in this conversation about this topic, uh, then maybe uh, I did um, uh, should start to explore my interest uh, and think about further management studies. And I remember distinctly in that session feeling very confused and very overwhelmed in 2014 uh, about the topic. It's a pretty big topic and a pretty complex topic, but uh, it was very inspirational for me and got me thinking. Uh, and so the fact uh, that uh, that five years later I was on uh, uh, um, uh, Capitol Hill kind of working uh, with lawmakers uh, in leadership uh, on exploring uh, important and critical topics gave me the inspiration again to return to uh, where things began and uh, I looked uh, at uh, the School of Management website and noticed this brand new fellowship that was opening uh, and if anybody knows the Roberta Flack soft killing me softly I felt like they were <laughs> strumming my pain with their fingers and, and you know, singing my life with a song I felt like uh, the, the description that I saw really fit me to the T and was very inspirational um, I also uh, should share just this background as I was aware of the Commonwealth Fund Fellowship at Harvard University. Uh, I remember as an intern in 2009 and 2010, recognizing the importance of that program and the leadership of Dr. Joan Reed at Harvard, but never really wanting to kind of explore a master's in public health. Just for some reason in the back of my mind, uh, I just wanted to explore uh, management studies. And so to have this program at, at, in a location that I appreciated uh, and to really value uh, Yale's kind of commitment to education, growth, and leadership uh, inspired me to apply for the fellowship and was quite pleased uh, when I was a, a part of the, the third cohort. We were quite pleased too. Oh, <laughs> yeah. That's wonderful, Stephen. Thank you so much for sharing that. And so many connections to uh, to How Howie in so many different ways. Uh, it all starts with Howie, or uh, yes. uh, Dr. Yes. Foreman. All roads, all roads. Yes, all <laughs> roads from Howie. Um, so uh, I'd love to, so more so, uh, Dr. Nunez Smith, you mentioned earlier um, that there are a lot of um, other elements that build on top of the uh, MBA for Executives program that really makes this fellowship. Um, can you talk a little bit about that, uh, those uh, co-curricular aspects and how does that build sort of the, uh, the community and the knowledge uh, and uh, some of the things that uh, Dr. Starks also refer, uh, referenced in terms of uh, connections with uh, speakers and, uh, and such? Yeah, no, absolutely. So, um, uh, so again, it begins with this very rigorous uh, EMBA experience, and then we build upon right for the fellowship. And so, as as you um, you know, as you alluded to, there are several co curricular activities that are all um, really intended to both sync with that EMBA uh, and also deepen the exposure and experience of health equity leadership, both in terms of um, expanding what we refer to as the knowledge network. So meeting individuals who are uh, really walking this walk on this journey and can help impart wisdom, um, uh, particular skills and also uh, opportunity for our fellows, right? Um, I, I would probably lift up a, a, a few uh, right now. And um, again, with appreciation to uh, Dr. Gonzalez Colasso, as well as to our other director, uh, Dr. C.C. Calhoun, who also went through the program and is our newest uh, director to join the leadership team. Um, there are policy immersion activities, right? And so each year we alternate between thinking regionally and thinking on a national level about leaders uh, and making sure that um, uh, in a in this sort of immersive experience, our fellows have opportunities very intimate. I mean, I think that is the the name of this experience. It's going to be intimate. It's the fellows always 
um, in conversation with key decision makers and leaders who are able to bring uh, this intersection of the business of healthcare with how we think about health equity. So whether it's our immersion experiences, it's our Thursday night workshops. Um, this is a part where I stop and say, you know, working with the EMBA team, we think a lot about logistics too, right? We understand the lives of our fellows. Um, and so there is a great effort taken to make sure that, for example, these Thursday nights are not gonna be in conflict with other things that are in the EMBA calendar, um, for example. So on the Thursday nights, those are two hour workshops where we have an opportunity to both think about um, skills, to think about uh, conversations with some of these key leaders, um, and to also work on the capstone, which is another signature uh, element of the fellowship program. It's really about taking the skills, the learnings, and putting them uh, into action. Um, so from the very beginning of the process, we are thinking and talking with fellows about, um, about that capstone and creating opportunities uh, through a capstone committee and through our Thursday nights to support the fellows through that capstone process. Um, we also have other great opportunities to interface with our NAC, our National Advisory Committee, and another group of outstanding leaders. Dr. Starks has just joined as an alumni representative on the NAC. Thank you for that. Um, and that is another great opportunity to expand the knowledge network of our fellows and really to have thought partnership with the members of the NAC. Bob Posen generously also makes time to meet with the fellows um, and to provide just incredible insights, uh, really thinking particularly through that business lens um, to sort of uh, really facilitate the fellows thinking about bringing these different skill sets now together and harmonizing that. And as Dr. Starks mentioned, through the Commonwealth Fund, we have opportunities to do a policy day with them, to have uh, chances to be in fellowship and in learning with the sibling programs, such as the program um, up at Harvard, uh, the Harkness Fellows and others supported by the Commonwealth Fund. So these co-curricular opportunities, again, building upon that uh, strong platform of the, of the executive MBA. And what a tremendous amount of uh, opportunity afforded to the fellows. Uh, Dr. Starks, if you could speak a little bit about how are you, I mean, obviously the MBA for Executives program is also very demanding. Um, how were you, were you able to sort of uh, juggle both and uh, how did it uh, sort of, what was the experience like and did you have a favorite moment maybe? <laughs> Yeah, it was. Um, yes, yeah, so it was uh, a program and a lot to balance. Uh, so just uh, for myself, I had to uh, be mindful about uh, the different uh, pressures and the different things pulling toward my attention. Right. So working as as a full time faculty member, uh, I think many of our fellows also engage in other activities uh, in other organizations. Uh, so um, that's uh, we're, we are used to the juggling act, uh, and so I had been quite. Uh, invested and involved um, in my professional uh, home, the American Psychiatric Association, uh, uh, which uh, where I'm uh, now a, a member of our board of trustees and, and serve as speaker of our assembly of district branches. Uh, I've also been quite involved in the Association of American Medical Colleges uh, Action Collaborative for Black Men in Medicine. Um, and uh, again, I think juggling and balancing uh, those activities along with the uh, work uh, in the school and the program uh, can be a lot. Uh, but I think the one thing that keeps us all grounded uh, is the support, uh, particularly the support of, of what feels like our first home, the fellowship team. We actually start our immersion experience before we start the Ember program at the SOM. And so that kind of gives us a framework uh, having the opportunity to engage with local, state, and national leaders and kind of hear their story and their perspectives and uh, for them to kind of offer us and pour into us insights on how they address disparities in healthcare and how they work toward equ equity, that sets the framework. Uh, and then once you start or engage in the Ember program, you have the support of your classmates and your peers, right? So flying from Houston uh, was, was a bit of a challenge, uh, but luckily for, unfortunately for me, uh, I also had other students uh, here locally in Houston uh, who uh, would, would, would support me and, and uh, we kind of came up with plans and strategies and just in terms of that, tra that travel and that commitment. And so you do feel like when you are in the program, you still have a home away from home. You do those weeks um, in, in between your, your class weekends. Uh, and really just the support of your, your teams, your learning teams in the program, the support of the, the staff uh, and, and uh, faculty of the Ember program as well, helped you to kind of juggle uh, and to find, or try to find balance. Uh, again, I think we're all probably on this call still searching 
for opportunities for, for balance and restoration. But I do think there is just a great synergy and an overlap again from having the formal program and the workshops of the fellowship and having kind of engaging in all of the curriculum for the Ember program that offers this, this great balance. Uh, so for me, it didn't feel taxing or overwhelming. It actually felt like a safe haven and a safe place to, to fly into New Haven. Uh, for the, um, the class weekends. Uh, that was a place that maybe I had more clarity, <laughs> maybe some more challenges when I returned home, but definitely feeling very kind of comfortable uh, over the class weekends. That's wonderful, thank you. Um, I'm gonna pose this question to uh, Dr. Foreman and Dr. Nuna Smith. Um, uh, Dr. Sarks spoke earlier about his uh, thought process for uh, the, the fellowship, the timing, you know, um, I'd love to hear a little from both of you what you, um, uh, your insight into, you know, when is it the right time for a, a candidate to come into, uh, to explore sort of uh, the fellowship and the, uh, the EMBA program? Um, you know, what is, uh, what is the profile uh, that the fellowship is looking for? Uh, where do you think that they would get the most, um, most uh, success or most uh, back from a fellowship like this? So, so let me just start off really quickly and just say that my opinion is it's never too early to reach out to our office, to ourselves, uh, our alums, our current students to talk to them and that everybody should think of themselves as a potential applicant and not talk themselves out of it just because it's a competitive process. So that would be number one. Uh, number two is that, you know, we're looking for people that are early mid-career, uh, but that doesn't mean that that that's a hard and fast definition of what stage you're at. I, I think it's all it's all in the eye of the beholder. And so don't let age guide you. Don't let, you know, whether you think that you're already a senior person or whether you think of yourself as a junior person, let us guide you about those issues. I do think business schools benefit from you having life experience, but without question, the applicants that we're seeing already have some life experience. And the only question is how much do they have? Uh, and again, let our um, really qualified admissions staff and POSEN staff help you figure out where you fit in that right now, because I think that we want um, a diverse pool of people. And I think some people, may not realize just how much they can add to the experience that our students um, hear from when they're in the classroom. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I, you know, with with everything um, how he said, I mean, I would I would add when it comes to the fellowship uh, program, and I think Stephen said it best already, right? You really the the ideal moment is someone who is we have to talk about people on the cusp, right? So already leading, um, uh, really doing great work, already a demonstrated commitment. I often talk about this as health equity, you know, 3.0. So, you know, folks who are who are doing this work um, and have a track record of doing this work um, are gonna be the people best situated for success, really to take advantage of this, um, this opportunity. Uh, but that part is really important too. Uh, you know, that's a question I'm I I'm always um have a deep curiosity in talking to applicants about kind of why now in their career and this um this sort of moment when folks are reflecting and thinking about what next and on the cusp of their next leadership uh, challenge and opportunity uh, is is really a great time right for um uh, for them to to think about. Uh, putting that application in. But just to circle back and underscore those conversations, we welcome those conversations to start early um, in this process. And with thanks to the admissions uh, team that will happily kind of engage. And so I think it's true that a lot of times people might um, sort of take themselves out of the process. Either they're like, I don't think I'm ready to apply this year. So then they don't reach out. Um, or for the other reasons how we mentioned, but the but the admissions team is here to help uh, think with people, help think through things like timing. We know there are a lot of things. You heard it, Stephen. There are a lot of things to 
that are going to be personal too, to think about when the right time is um, for you. This The fellowship is an in-person fellowship uh, program um, and all that comes with the logistics and the planning and obviously being here for the class weekends, uh, as Stephen already mentioned. So we recognize that part too, but definitely we encourage everyone, if you're thinking about it, have a very low threshold just to reach out and start those conversations um, ASAP. And if I could just add to, to that as well, I think that's an important part of it. So I, you know, again, first learned of the uh, program in 2019, but didn't apply, I guess that was until uh, 2021. So again, uh, engaging with the admissions team, kind of completing the uh, assessments that's available. I'd gone to uh, one of the um, ed, uh, uh, admissions uh, sessions in uh, DC uh, to kind of learn more about the program and got an opportunity to engage with uh, alums, current students, um, and prospective students uh, during that process, uh, keeping the relationship going. The admissions team you'll find is very supportive and, and will definitely kind of steer you and point you in the right direction. Uh, and then for me, it was also about, you know, finding the right employment opportunity, right? So it is a balance and a commitment. Uh, you do need your your supervisor. So I had planted the seed very early, actually, in my interview process and saying that I wanted to kind of further my studies at some point in time. You know, I think I'm, I'm thinking about, uh, you know, doing an MBA at some point in time. Would you be willing to support that? So planting those seeds early uh, and then ultimately was able to find the support of my chair uh, and the dean uh, in order to, you know, uh, allow me to have this time to, to do the program. Uh, and so, again, uh, that may take time. So while you're listening uh, to this uh, session today, Again, just recognize that you know uh, you you may be applying at a, at a later date, uh, but again, you you do have some help and support uh, uh, along the way in trying to figure out when is the best time and and when uh, is it uh, most you know feasible for you to to complete the the program. So definitely, uh, uh, start planting the seeds and start the exploration process. Um, Dr. Starks, I, I do want to go back to you. You just graduated last year, and I know you talked a little bit about sort of all the wonderful things that you're you're currently doing, but um, can you share how the fellowship has really impacted your work and, and the fellowship and the MBA has impacted your work and your leadership capabilities in general and really addressing disparities in healthcare in the time, you know, since uh, since when you started the program in 2021? Yeah. 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 I think uh, the biggest thing that it is has is, is offered me is just uh, it offers you this shift in mindset and you just become a more strategic thinker in the work that you do. Um, um, you know, you can become or, or I feel like I've become much more intentional in my work. Uh, it has changed my work uh, on my national committees and, and the other activities that I do. I've, I've gotten a, a, few, a few questions from people on a couple of boards that I serve on. They kind of inquisitively ask, you must have an MBA kind of based on my line of questions <laughs> as it ties to some of the, the programs that we're developing and has offered me just an incredible uh, deal of insights. I'd also say that it's added to kind of, um, you know, how I interact with my peers and colleagues. So I've also uh, been able to pay it forward uh, to help other uh, peers strategize part of the Ember program as you get some peer coaching and you also have some executive coaching. And I've been able to uh, help uh, a lot of my colleagues around me, which was a little bit of a surprise uh, in order to make good decisions as it, as it comes to how they're exploring kind of making impacts in, in equity uh, related to their work and, and to their careers. I also think it gives you just a sense of, of confidence, right? I think uh, Marcel and how we have been sharing, right? You're you're already selecting leaders, uh, but sometimes you you know it, you see it, but you don't always kind of fully uh, take it on. Uh, I do kind of clearly identify myself as a as a leader now, uh, and I'm very strategic as I think about what are the next steps in my career, right? So when you're facing uh, a challenge, perhaps in your own institution or organization thinking about ways, again, of, of moving uh, into the next phase. And, and for me, more recently, that have, has been starting to think about, you know, developing my own enterprise. I feel like the timing, again, is, is right to do that. And so uh, that's something I'm, I'm looking to explore in this next 12 months uh, in terms of where I move on um, with my career. Uh, and I also think, again, uh, it's made, made me, again, more strategic in my work with organizations of impact. Uh, so whether that's the Association of American Medical College, colleges or the American Psychiatric Association, just finding the synergies in, in terms of some of the work that I'm doing in order to really kind of drive uh, things forward. Uh, and one of my biggest um, things that I'm focused on, again, is efforts towards workforce and inclusion uh, and really kind of addressing the broad dis disparities that we see in, in mental health and substance use treatment. So 
Uh, I can't speak more highly of the fellowship and the program. Uh, and I also uh, just uh, to kind of add to that, um, one thing that maybe um, uh, I want folks to consider is the uh, other aspects. So even here, I'm still in, in Houston, Texas. Uh, there's a great uh, network um, through the Yale Club of Houston here, and again, other peers and alumnus of the university and of SOM, who again, uh, help me to uh, focus on uh, local uh, drivers of, of change as well. So um, it really, again, just uh, has shaped, you know, how I strategize, view, and, and think about um, implementing uh, uh, key kind of policies in, in my various organizations and institutions. That's wonderful. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Starks, uh, we are we have uh, a few questions coming through, and uh, I want to make sure that we save some time for them. So, um, perhaps uh, Howie, I see the first question uh, is probably right up your alley. If you want to uh, maybe uh, state the question and then uh, help address that. Sure. The question is about outcomes, and just to be clear, the EMBA program sat the first class in 2005, but we've been doing work in the healthcare space from before that. But just looking at the EMBA program, not specifically the POSEN program, uh, we have amazing examples of our impact in the health equity space. And I'll just give you two quick examples. Maybe I'll come up with some others while I talk about them. But we had a woman who uh, had started to make a journey down to Mississippi to the community health centers there in between her sessions as a private practice gastroenterologist in the uh, New Haven area. And she became more and more convinced that there was much more good that she could do in time. And even though she was later in career and quite frankly, around my age right now, maybe a couple of years younger than I am right now, she did the EMBA program about 10 years ago or so. Uh, and early on in the program, she said to me, I've decided to leave my group and I'm going to look for a different job because I believe I can make a huge difference now. And your program has allowed me to do that. And I worried about that. This is somebody who is, you know, not at a point of retiring. And, and yet she was now committed to something differently. And lo and behold, within just a few months, she became the CEO of our uh, second largest community health center in the New Haven area. Uh, and just a few years after that, accompanied our uh, Congresswoman, Rosa DeLauro, to the State of the Union address because of all the work she has done to help uh, service the, um, the minoritized, marginalized, uh, impoverished immigrant populations in New Haven and provide them with a more accessible health care. And she even went one step further, and Dr. Nunez-Smith uh, worked with her during this time during the pandemic to make sure that these populations were not adversely impacted by the disease and were, were able to gain access to vaccines early on. And so that was one example. One other example is a young, younger woman, a much younger woman, um, we even wondered, was she too young at the time, who was a nurse midwife who had graduated the Yale Nursing School and was a practicing nurse midwife in our community. Um, and felt she too could do much more. And she even told us about the story of how she had gone to a, a rally in support of women's agency and, and healthcare rights when she was a undergraduate at Rice University. It all comes back to Texas, I guess. Um, and she, um, you know, went and when she finished the program, moved on to various other opportunities, including consulting things that might not make you think about health equity. But when the opportunity came for her to be the CEO of Planned Parenthood of Southern New England, she not only grabbed that opportunity, but has really embraced the important role that Planned Parenthood uh, plays in our communities of color, in our marginalized, minoritized, impoverished communities. Again, Planned Parenthood plays that role for so many women and and others, not just women in our community. And, and she has also become an amazing voice in support of health equity. And those are just quick examples that come to mind. Those are clinically oriented examples. There are also many others who we've seen go work for private firms in the Medicaid space um, who have really taken to heart what we've taught them and what they've learned during our program to make sure that Medicaid patients, of which we have well more than 80 million impoverished people in this country, are getting the type of access to health care that they deserve. 
So I'll just stop with that, but I just want to amplify those first two questions were about outcomes. And while I can't tell you data points, like I don't think we track whether 17% of people have migrated more or less towards health equity, I can tell you more than anecdotally, we have good evidence of our impact. Yeah. And and I was going to say, Dr. Nunes Smith, you uh, taught a, a class uh, in the EMMA program on population health. Um, and uh, and can you share a little bit, I, I know we've had conversations about this, but can you share a little bit sort of about the level of conversation that occurs in the classroom and yeah. how that's changed since the fellowship? Yeah, absolutely. You know, and um, so absolutely the classes on population health and health equity and to, again, uh, the great credit of, of SOM and looking around this call. I mean, this is a class that um, that I was teaching before the fellowship uh, was here, right? And so, you know, again, to think about just um, the skill set of an MBA, but also the Yale School of Management and why I think this is the exactly perfect home for the Pose and Commonwealth Fund Fellowship. Um, but that class, extraordinary, right? And so I think, you know, I, I really appreciated what you said um, as you were getting us started, Wendy, right? Like this this fellowship has helped contribute to changing um, sort of the learning environment uh, here and really accelerating. And over the arc of the, the years, I think this is year seven, the class is running, right? Classes are going on now. Um, like over, over that time, it's really elevated our discussion. And what I um, what I have appreciated as faculty um, is the spirit in which everyone shows up uh, in that class, right? And across the classes with, with knowledge, curiosity, recognition of the importance of this topic, the relevance to thinking of these questions of sort of business of healthcare, um, societal impact uh, and need, think about these structural barriers. Uh, and of course, it's wonderful to have the fellows um, in the classroom, not just in that class, but across all the classes. But you know, I I would really say, again, to the credit of the fellows who are doing that peer work as well outside of the classroom, you know, people are showing up engaged and it has just been a great, you know, compliment, I think, to the system when um, when folks have said, like, look, we find this this material incredibly valuable. We just have not gotten it other places until now. And this is so useful. I'm taking it back tomorrow, right, to where I work. And I think that is just part of the power and the magic, right, of the, of the of the MBA for executives, right, of the fellowship is that there's just real time opportunities to apply um, the learnings and people are bringing real life questions and challenges that they're facing into the classroom for us to sort of workshop um, and advise around. And so it's just a really vibrant learning uh, community. We do keep the fellowship activities close to the fellows. Um, and so again, back to preserving that intimacy in community. Um, uh, but there really, I think, is a great spirit here of understanding um, why it's important for everyone in the curriculum to be exposed to some of this content, really, as they're thinking about their own leadership journeys. Thank you. Um, we do have another question here. Uh, could you explain how the insights and emphasis of the fellowship may expand with the shifts of health policies across congressional sessions or executive administrations? I feel we touched upon this a little bit, but maybe can put that out there uh, for, for, uh, for a response. I would just very quickly say that we are agnostic to who's in power. We may have a preference personally, and we may even talk about that personally, but we're agnostic to who's in, in power at any time. I think we we did just as excellent teaching under Trump with a Republican Congress as we did with Obama with a Democratic Congress and with a Republican Congress. We are, and our speakers come from all walks of life. We have Republican speakers, Democratic speakers, we have people who you would not know what party they're a member of. And, and so we're proud of that. Um, and I think we do an excellent job on that. We had Tom Scully here last year. Uh, he's a former uh, Bush administration head of CMS. We've had former Democratic heads of CMS and we'll continue to do that, I think, effectively. And uh, Dr. Foreman curates an amazing uh, list of speakers for his colloquium. Uh, sessions and as well uh, the um, Dr. Nunes Smith and other faculty 
for the fellowship, you the list of uh, speakers that you bring in um, for those Thursday night workshops are really an incredible list. Um, I know you mentioned earlier that this is an in-person program. Can uh, can someone participate in the fellowship remotely? The fellowship. Uh, I'm sorry, Wendy. Go ahead. Yeah, at the EMBA and the fellowship remotely. Yeah, and and really get the value out of it. Yeah, there is, um, we, you know, we have learned, all of us have our own stories about when we sort of had to go, you know, remotely, and we're, we, you know, we're grateful that we were still able to continue, obviously, with both the EMBA, um, as well as the fellowship, when we were unable to be in person. Um, but there's just uh, immense value, right, in being in community in person, and the fellowship is in person, and that's the that's the expectation. Um, you know, I think you know Stephen is well positioned to talk. He already talked about things like the learning teams and others, like with the EMBA, why there's also I think just incredible uh, value to to maximizing the in per the FaceTime um, with your classmates and with the faculty, and certainly for the fellowship, as I as I mentioned, you know, we are six fellows at a at a time. Um, the the there's always sort of a first year and second year cohort within the fellowship program. And so uh, we are grateful. I mean, as Howie mentioned, we have been fortunate that, you know, extremely um, busy, accomplished uh, people sort of enroll or saying yes to coming, whether it's for the colloquium, whether it's for the Thursday nights. Uh, and it really changes the learning opportunity and dynamic when we don't have the full um, group of, of folks there to contribute to that conversation. So uh, we always, of course, understand when life happens and certainly there are emergencies that arise and other things, but we we want to just be, um, uh, you know, it's, uh, I think as Dr. Gonzalez Colas was telling me, you know, it's not that you have to be in person, it's that you get to be in person. And that is really the spirit of our fellowship opportunity. Yes, and, and those opportunities again, on the side of it are incredibly enriching and, and valuable. And again, um, trust me, the, the, the most is made of the time uh, when we are able to, to gather together for fellowship uh, in person. That's great, thank you. Um, uh, Dr. Starks, maybe if I can ask you, I know that we, um, we have other questions coming on, but I, if I can ask you sort of what was your favorite moment? You had so many uh, amazing experiences in both EMBA, but especially with the fellowship, like was there a speaker or an event that you participated in that was just like really stood out for you? Yes. Um, uh, yeah, I think for me, uh, both of the immersions uh, were incredibly just uh, so in inspiring. Uh, so um, for those who are not aware, again, that kind of uh, starts your phase of your fellowship program. And, and so in, in your first year or your year of entry, it, it occurs uh, for entry. The one I really that stands out the most to me, though, is, is the one uh, between first and second year. Again, it's this excitement and enjoyment about meeting the new uh, incoming uh, fellows uh, and your classmates. And I just remember just the conversation uh, and just how uh, quickly we connected uh, as a community uh, was just uh, just uh, just really um, just kind of overwhelming. And I really think reflected, uh, again, uh, a lot of the great work that our, our leadership puts into it. Uh, Rosanna, Marcella, and Howie are, again, are really kind of thoughtful and uh, behind developing that program. So the immersions really stand out uh, to me. Wonderful, thank you. Um, one last question. Um, this has been asked a couple of times, but and I. Uh, so, if you can talk a little bit more um, about uh, what you, what's the most, uh, what you consider for in terms of candidates for fellowship, what matters the most? Is there particular types of um, degrees that you're looking for? Years of work experience, um, focus in work, et cetera. I, I would just start off by saying we look at the whole application. Obviously, somebody has to be competitive for the EMBA program to begin with, and that has a rigorous admissions process on its own. Um, and then in addition to that, we're looking for individuals who are firmly committed to health equity, who uh, are going to add to the experience of the other fellows and the other students in the class, um, and for whom we can have an impact on their career and their trajectory. But I'll, I'll let our program director speak beyond that. <laughs> Thank you, senior advisor. Yes. <laughs> I, I, you know, I, I don't think I have much to add. That's right. I mean, we're very fortunate. We've already said many times to have just um, 
a great admissions team here uh, led by Keith and obviously you, Wendy, who will help people think about their application within the context of both the EMBA um, and the fellowship program. I think what we really want to convey to um, to everyone is, you know, don't take yourself out of the process, right? If you're if you are interested and curious, reach out and learn more. I mean, I would speak maybe because I think I saw a couple around kind of um, you know, what is a healthcare leader? Uh, you know, we we recognize, uh, you know, I'm a practicing internal medicine um, uh, physician, Dr. Gonzalez Colasso's faculty in our PA program here. You know, we recognize that there are wide range of um, clinical training experiences that, you know, people are going to go through. And so ranging from it's, so it's not, so the answer is no, we're not only looking for physicians um, and nurses, I think was one of the questions. Um, but we definitely do have a preference for people who have had clinical training and, uh, but that ranges, right? All the people who interface with patients, it's a big care team um, in our system that we need to take care uh, of our patients and our neighbors. So we we take a um we take a, what we think is an appropriately broad view of who makes up the clinical care uh, clinical care team, but again, please reach out. Just have that conversation. Have it early, and we can assure you every application is is reviewed uh, holistically. And as a closing question, a uh, quick response, a lightning response. Uh, what's your one piece of adv advice that you would give to prospective students interested in the EMBA and the fellowship? Reach I'll out. start with- Reach out. Okay. I, I think I just have to say the same thing. <laughs> like, <laughs> it, 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 it's, it's reach out, right? Reach out, ask the question, have the conversation. Great, great. And it was going to be the same for me. So I'm, I'm, I was trying to think of something <laughs> else. Three for three. Said, three, said, three, 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 three. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Well, before we close out, uh, you might want to know more about the admissions and applications process. Uh, the application for the MBA for Executives program will open in mid-August, and the first deadline is October 28th. Uh, while we have three rounds of applications, we highly encourage you to apply in the first two rounds, the first round or the second round. Um, also, our faculty will be hosting a virtual health equity masterclass on Wednesday, 8, August 14th, and we hope you will be able to join us for that. Uh, more information will be forthcoming. And our admissions team will have upcoming webinars uh, that will highlight the EMBA program and the application process. And we invite you to visit us on campus in August and throughout the fall months. Uh, the best next step is really to reach out uh, to complete a pre-assessment through our website or to email us uh, directly at emba.admissions at yale.edu. We look forward to hearing from you. We hope you enjoyed our session today. Uh, I want to thank all of our panelists for being here, for taking the time to, uh, to speak with us today. Thank you so much. Thank you, Wendy. Thank you all. Thank you. Bye-bye, everyone.